Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Well, I have my mouth full of cake. How is that cake? It is pretty good. It's a lemon cake. You know, if you listened uh, to the podcast the last episode, we talked about fat preachers. <laughs> so you, you'll have to go back and listen to that. It inspired you. It inspired me. So this is a small cake. So the reason we're eating, those of you who have it, those of you, we got the camera on. If you can see this, no, we don't have YouTube here. But, but there's a reason we're eating cake. What's the reason? This is the 100th episode. The 100th episode. The 100th episode of this podcast. This is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. It feels like a blur. But it's been amazing. Revitalize and replant. 100 100 episode. episode. And we've done it in like eight months. Let's talk about the places we've been. So we started on the couch. Well, now that, sounds a, little, that sounds a little weird. At our church, I, Inglewood. <laughs> okay. The, okay. The, white, the white couch. In the, your church basement. In our church basement. That's right. We started there, you, Dan, and me. Right. Then we went, where did we go next? Uh, if we went to Midwestern Seminary. Midwestern. At one Spurgeon point. Library. Spurgeon Library. And then we went to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. That's right. And we did it Convention. there. Yep. And then we came to NAM, North American yep. Mission Board, and we yep. did it here. Then we went back to the Spurgeon back Library. Back to Spurgeon. And then we're back here. And then back to NAM. But we want to go to some other places. And we've gone to, and you, and then we came back to Denver another we can't, time. Oh, no, we did Denver three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, we've been come to, to Denver, Denver three been to, times. Denver three yeah. times. Yep. And uh, if anybody from Gateway is listening, we would love to come out to— Hey, listen, we're waiting for the invite. We're, yeah, we'll come out to Gateway Seminary and do it there. Oh, we'll, we'll come we out to— We need to get to Southeast. We'll, we need to get to all the all seminaries. All the seminaries. Yeah. You invite us, we'll come. I'm not going to wait for the phone to ring. Okay, anyway, <laughs> today on our 100th episode, <laughs> all right, stay tuned. At the end of this, we have a giveaway. Not really. Uh, anyhow, what we're going to talk about today is volunteers— Volunteers, mm. volunteers, volunteers. How can I recruit volunteers? How can I how yeah. can I find people to serve in places in leadership in my church? I hear it all the time, Mr. Halleck. Yep. I can't find people to volunteer. This is an article by mm-hmm. Chuck Peters, and we're gonna look at five ways that you can mm-hmm. and this uh, can help you find volunteers. By the way, this came out of a a survey by LifeWay, seventy-seven mm. percent of pastors say developing volunteers is a main issue they need to address, and it is really hard to find yeah. ministry leaders. That's significant, it yeah. is. Yep. And really, yesterday's methods of trying to attract and engage volunteers do not yeah. work. Well, would you say that in the past, maybe even twenty, thirty years ago, maybe forty, whatever? There was almost an expectation in the church that if you were a member of a church, you were you would volunteer no, in some way. It was total expectation. It was total expectation. Total it was expectation. an expectation, and uh, and now it's amazing. You'll have people in a church; they're faithful, maybe to come to worship. That's but the it. thought of serving no isn't even on their radar. No, it's even on their radar. It's not even on their radar. No. And so, so today we're talking about how do we change that culture in our churches? And so, let's start with number one. Okay, number one is stop leading with need and obligation. And this is the number one way I hear pastors recruit volunteers. Mm, And you know how I often hear it? I hear it on this way. We need workers in the nursery. We don't have enough workers in the nursery. Uh, If you could volunteer, we really need some workers in the nursery. Mm -hmm. We need workers Mm -hmm. with children. We that whole thing of we need as and that obligation. And, you know, you're a member here. You should serve. Guilt, I love this. This is such a good sentence that he writes. Guilt is no longer an effective means of recruitment. It was never an appropriate yeah. means of recruitment. Yep, yep. All right? Yep. Well, um, hey, Ken, let me say something about this because, you know, your you're folks, you're faithful, sweet people. They love you. And for a while, they will do this for a while. They'll do it out of obligation. Some. Some will. But you know what? They're not going to come alive. No. They're not going to come alive. They're no. going to do it out of duty and obligation. This is where good leadership says, and we're going to get to some of this, is we don't want you to do this because you, we just need you to or you have to do it. We want to get you in a slot where you are using the gifts God has given you, the passions you have, and, and that's when people come alive. So you lead with need and obligation and guilt 
Well, guess what, man? You're not going to get the, the kind of caliber of leader that's passionate that you need and that that ministry needs. Yeah, and it doesn't work anymore. I mean, for, for millennials, for Gen Z— It'll that, actually turn them off. It will turn them off. Yep. Now, for an older generation, they were sort of used to doing things out of obligation. That's right. They, we do want to be faithful. This we want to be do. faithful. That's yep. what we do. Yep. And, you know, boy, if the church needs me, I'll be there. Yep. That doesn't work anymore. Yep. And as I said, it never really worked. Yeah, yeah. People, right. people who did it didn't do it for the joy of the Lord. Right. They did it because they felt guilty if they didn't do it. That's right. Um, yeah. I, I, I have some close friends who will volunteer for everything. Mm. And I will ask them, and I have in a recent conversation— why did you agree to do that? Well, somebody had to. Well, that's not a reason. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is yeah. not a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Did the Lord tell you to do yeah, that? Yeah, are yeah. you glorifying yeah. him? Yeah. Is it, are you growing spiritually? Mm. Or is it actually going to have the mm-hmm. opposite results? Yeah. Yeah. So no longer can yeah. you just say, boy, we need nursery workers. Yeah. We need someone to serve on the finance committee. Yeah. We need people to serve us. No. Yeah, yeah you're not, you're, you're not going to get the leaders you need. And, and that leads to number two. So don't do that. Instead, here's what we would say number two, is communicate a clear and compelling why. Oh, that why, is so Why good. should we do this? It's so important. So if you want to have preschool workers, why don't you, for a few Sundays, uh, have some great photos of the preschoolers in mm-hmm. worship and uh, during worship and uh, doing their thing during an extended session or whatever they do during, during worship. Have some great photos of that and show them up on the screen. Yep. And for a few Sundays, just talk about what an amazing ministry it is to children, that even kids two and three years old can understand that the church is a place where they're loved. It's a place they want to come to. Yes. It's a place of joy. It's a place of happiness. It may be the first place they hear about Jesus. They hear about God. It's transforming in their life. You can remind the church that much of a kid's personality is fully developed before he's five years old. Mm-hmm. What a great time. And, yep. how think, and show pictures of the workers you have now. How thankful we are for Mary and for Carl and for Betty and how they serve. And maybe bring them up and pray for them and thank them. Do that for a few weeks. Yes, yes. All right? And then you're beginning to complete, c- c- rather communicate a clear and compelling why we need children's yep, workers. Yep, yep. I love that idea of have a few of those volunteers come up and share why do they do this? Yes. What do they love about it? Right. You know, if you're, if you, if you're talking youth ministry, right. have a few teenagers actually come up yes. and talk about the impact yes. that— Folks in the church are having in their or lives. Or if it's even something like the finance committee, find someone who really finds meaning in that and mm. let them share and say, you know, I, I really enjoy yep. being able to use my gifts of finance and business to help the church. I learned so much about it. I learned how to pray about it yep. and all those things. And then you'll you'll find you're really creating a compelling why yeah. we should do this. This is why if you have not done a short like mini series in a while on spiritual gifts and casting vision for that for your church and helping people see that as pastors, we're called to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Right. That every believer is gifted for ministry. Right. Pastor, you got to cast some vision. You got to passionately paint a picture of what the church looks like when everybody's in ministry using their gifts together in unity. And that's exciting. And that brings new life to your church. And so again, you're leading with the why, why, why do we do this? Ultimately, we do it for the glory of God. We're gifted for it. And uh, there are real needs that do need to be met joyfully. And not- Kyle, Kyle will put this in the show notes, this whole document, so you can have it. But listen, listen to what our writer says here. This is so good, guys. Listen up. People today are indeed busier than ever. Every decision to say yes means they have to say no to something else. It's not that people are unwilling to serve. Oh, this is so good. They want to know their service makes a measurable difference. They need assurance that something meaningful will be manifest because of their investment of time and energy. Man, it wow. is so important that you give them a declaration of missional purpose, mm-hmm. why we need to do this, yes. why it's important, what it will mean to you in your life, not that we just need someone on the finance team. Yep. We need someone in the nursery. We need someone to be a chaperone at the youth retreat. Yep. That is not it. You've got to communicate. That means, guys, there has to be a strategy. You, have yep. to, you can't just get up on Sunday morning and say, yep. we, need, we need youth workers to, mm-hmm, to chaperone. Mm-hmm. you got to back up a little bit and say, how do I communicate this well? How do we create an environment where people yep. want to serve? Yep. How do we create an environment where people see serving is a joy? Yes. And, you know, I, I often said in a, in a new church situation as you're developing it, sometimes in an older church you can't go necessarily back and engineer this. But I always said two and no more. I mean, 
every person in the church should mm. have two jobs and no more. Mm. If you're a deacon and you serve in the nursery, no more. Mm-hmm. Don't have three. Don't have four. Mm-hmm. Do those well. Two those and no more. And, well. and and not only those two, but in those two, begin to develop someone around you that can take your place. That's right. Right? Too deep is what we say. That's good. All right. I love that. Number three. Okay, number three, clarify expectations. Why, why is this so important? Well, you say we need X, Y, and Z, and they have no real idea what that means. Mm. And then they get into it, and they feel like they failed because they didn't know what you wanted from them. Yep. And one of the reasons people won't accept the job is they don't know exactly what you expect out of them. For example, finance team, you need to be very clear. Unless there's something unusual, it's going to meet five times a year. Right. And those meetings will last about two hours each. Yep. You know, those, whatever it is, let them know. That gives mm. them information. Otherwise, they don't know what they're getting into. That's exactly right. So be very clear about what it is that you're asking to do, what their expectations are. Uh, It's the responsibility of you as the pastor to clarify exactly what's expected from a volunteer. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a good one. Do you have volunteer job descriptions? Yes, yes. That makes it so much easier. For sure. If you spend some time talking about uh, being on the finance committee or serving on the house and grounds or serving with the youth or with the children or with the, the nursery, and you sort of create an environment over the last few weeks where you're talking about those things, then you have a small job description. What does it mean to serve in the nursery once a month? Yep. What's it mean to serve on the yep. finance? And say, we have job descriptions. You may want to take these home, pray over the look at them. That kind of information really mm. helps them make a decision. Well, and it helps them, one, here's why it's not only clarifying for them, but now you're on the same page to celebrate wins when those things are actually lived out. Right. It also provides accountability because volunteers do need accountability. They do. But if there's no clear expectations, if I'm a volunteer, I'm going, well, hey, man, you never even told me that, that that was the expectation. you know. And so it's not good leadership. And so we want to be clear, again, not just for the accountability that needs to be there, but also to say, man, see what God's doing? In this, you know, you signed up for this, and look at the fruit we're seeing because of your faithfulness. And volunteers who buy into the why, not just the need, but Mm -hmm. the why, are more deeply invested, Mm -hmm. and they simply will stay longer and serve longer. That's right. And you'll have to replace them less often. Far less. Number three. Yep, number four, actually. Oh, number I'm sorry. Four. Yeah, sorry. That's right. Number four. No, 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 it's good. Well, and this, they flow right together. Number four is give them an in and an out. Which the way we used to talk about that at Calvary is create easy on ramps and off ramps. Okay, what what does that ministry. look like? Well, what I think what that means is if I'm a new person or a new person, or maybe I've been in the church but I haven't been involved, we need to make it really clear how to get connected and how to get involved. So in terms of serving, um, if I'm sitting there and going, man, I feel like God's doing this in response to this sermon. You know, I think I'd really love to volunteer with the kiddos. If it's not clear what the pathway is, then I'm just going to keep sitting there and going, well, I don't know what to do with that. Does that make sense? Right. And one of the things we've done, even at Linwood, a small church where we are, uh, we'll say, hey, we're looking, we'll we'll talk about the need for children's, uh, I just said the need, we'll talk about the opportunity (laughs) for children's ministry and all that. We'll say, hey, how about we have four fifth Sundays a month. Would you be willing to, for this one year, take those four fifth Sundays and let's see how you feel about it and and how it works yeah. in your life. And if it doesn't, then that's all we'll do. That's a wonderful, easy on-ramp and easy off-ramp. And easy off-ramp. Or you say, you know what? We need chaperones for a youth retreat. Yep. So it's just two nights and three yes. days. Yep. Just the one time. Just see how that would be. Find them some short-term yeah. uh, volunteer positions with a clear start date and a clear end date. Yes. And they'll be more likely to try that out. That's right. Than to just indefinitely be a youth sponsor from now on. Clear Exit ramps or off ramps are so important for that reason. It's two way. One is if it's not working for them, yes, they need to see there's a way out. Right. Otherwise, here's what happens: they'll either get frustrated or they'll just they'll just ghost you and go they'll, to another. I mean, they'll leave. They'll leave the church. They'll just leave the church over. That's it. right. It also allows you as a leader to have an off ramp if it's not working, and you can say, "Hey, man, we've given this a shot. It's been great." Let's try something else, you know? Let's see through this, and then let's do something else. So it protects you. It's good for them. It's good for the church. Right. All right, number five kind of all leads to this. Make it personal. Make yeah, it personal. Man. I mean, again, our writer says, the practice of enlisting volunteers by making announcements to the entire congregation from the platform or a bullet insert is just ineffective. Yeah. Let me ask you to do something, guys, and maybe this is wrong. I've been wrong before. 
don't, Ra- rarely. Don't. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> don't do either one of those things. Do not ask for yeah. volunteers on Sunday morning, and do not put it in the bulletin. Why? Well, first of all, it it sort of sends a message that things aren't going well. That if I if I'm new and I have children and I'm visiting and I realize and you say we don't have near enough children's workers, I'm thinking, well, this may not be the church for me because mm-hmm. I care about my yeah. kids and my youth. So if they don't have enough workers, that's a warning mm-hmm. sign. Mm-hmm. Why do you, don't they advertise that? Secondly, mainly, it doesn't work. Yeah. If it worked, we wouldn't be having this podcast. Right, right, if all right. it took mm-hmm. to get volunteers was for you to announce it or put it in the bulletin, we're done. Yeah, It doesn't work. It has to be personal. Mm-hmm. It has to be personal. Yeah. When asks are made to the masses, this is so important, everyone assumes somebody else is going to respond. Yeah, exa- every time. Every time. Every time. Every time. That's right. And this is the power of, again, and, and if you're not real comfortable with this, Pastor, ask the Lord to give you some boldness and courage. Lean into the awkwardness. Lean into the awkward, baby. Lean into it. Because there's nothing more powerful than sitting across the table over coffee with someone and looking at them and saying, listen, the Lord has gifted you. And I've been watching you, and I love your heart, and I'm so glad you're at this church. And man, we want to get you plugged into ministry. And what's God, what's God doing in you? What do you feel called? Listen, that's how you get them in the game. It's that. It's not a, an insert or a mass uh, announcement. Go after them individually. That's right. And as you're discipling people and you see God doing things in their life, affirm that in their life. Yes. And say, look, yes. I think the next thing for you would be to see if God would use you in this area for mm. a short time. I think you have the giftedness to do that. And mm-hmm. don't, and by all means, guys, don't be manipulative. Right. I mean, right, if you yeah, don't think no. they have the giftedness, no, no, but no. you've got to have a volunteer. Yeah. Man, don't be doing that. Yeah. That's, that'll that, hurt that'll people. That'll come back to bite you. It'll, it'll crush people. Yeah. I'm saying you, part of your job, you know, I was with Richard Blackaby uh, recently. And, oh, man, God love him. Uh, this guy came up to Richard and he said, because um, Richard was talking about volunteers. And Richard said, I've never had a struggle having people volunteer in any church I've served. Well, that offended some people, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it just did. Rather than going, oh, I'm so grateful that he had yeah, such a good yeah, ministry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thankfully, he was like, well, I bet you have. You're that, just not being honest. Yeah, you're yeah. lying. Yeah. So this guy came up to me and goes, well, Richard, I've been at this church for over 20 years, and I can't get anybody to do anything. I can't get any volunteers. We've tried everything we can do. My wife and I do it all, and no one does anything. And Richard said, how long have you been there? He said, I've been there 20 years. Richard said, well, that's your fault. It's your job to get volunteers. It's nobody else's job. Hmm. Did Jesus make you the under-shepherd of this church? Your job is to lead people to Christ, disciple them, mm-hmm. shape them, model mm-hmm. them into followers of Jesus mm-hmm. that serve Jesus. If that's not happening, that's nobody's fault but yours. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> now, here's what he said. He was yeah. real quick to say, but brother, yeah. I want you to know something. That's a learned behavior. Hmm. I, can't, I can't teach you calling. I can't teach you character. But I can teach you how you can develop leaders. Wow. And so apparently no one has taught you how to do that. And we can teach you. You can learn how to. And, and, and Richard is right. You can learn how to ask people. You can yes. learn how to be in their life. Yep. You can learn how to engage them. Mm-hmm. But you don't do that by simply saying, well, you're not responding. I'm telling you we yep. need leaders and nobody's volunteering. That is not. You have no. not. No. You, you have to raise up. You have to invest in people's yep. lives. Yep. You have to spend time in their home. You have to go hunting with them, fishing with them, and share the gospel with them and help them grow spiritually. Yeah. That's your job, to raise up the next generation right. of leaders. That's right. You know, and I would say this. If this is an area where you're not as strong in terms of, you know, um, casting vision and, 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 and mobilizing people to use their gifts, find a mentor. Find somebody, a pastor in your area or maybe a friend somewhere who's doing this well yes. that you can learn from and just pick their brain yes. and take notes. There's some great books out there. Please. I mean, I just think, you know, like, like Clifton said, man, we can grow in this. Praise yes, God. Yes, we can. This is an area where you can learn to do this task, all right? Mm. But you can't learn to do it if you just resent that nobody's volunteering. Right. And when you look at that other guy's church and you see all those people volunteering, it's not because his people are necessarily different than your people. It's that he's he's asking in a different way. Mm. And I agree with my brother here, man. Mm. If you go hang out with that pastor and say, Pastor, I've seen how you are able to engage volunteers. Would you give me some time and teach me how to do that? If that pastor tells you no, call me, give me his number, and I'll call him, and and I'll I'll have a talk with him. Because I guarantee you, every pastor I know would say, I'd be glad to share that with you, brother. They would love it. That's right. But it's your job to ask for the help. Okay, Kyle, you're going to put these in the show notes. These are some great insights from Chuck Peters. All of us need to know how to encourage, equip, 
and find volunteers in our church. Thank you for listening to Revitalize and Replant. The 100th episode. The 100th. The 100th old, episode. The old 100. Well, the old 100. The old 100. We should end by singing the old 100. You know what that I'll, is? I'll, you the solo doc, it. The doxology. <laughs> hey, you want to do it? I think it's copyrighted. Oh, okay. No, it's not copyrighted. Go ahead. You're okay, a singer. Sing, let's all go. Here we no, go. No, Kyle's okay, a grandma, singer. Okay, pra- praise God from whom all blessings flow. Come on, Kyle. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Come on. That was pretty good. Good job. That's right. You can pick up the CD at your local Christian bookstore. (laughs) Bye. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.